Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Building a Creative Portfolio Career. My name is Chrissy Farnbaugh, and I'm the Innovation and Engagement Director here at The Ohio Arts Council. Part of my role is to plan and facilitate professional learning opportunities for the field. And webinars like this one are being offered because constituents have told us you'd like to learn ways to do your work more efficiently and effectively. We have more than 50 people registered for the today's session, and we're really happy that you're taking an outer hour out of your day to join us. Before I introduce today's presenter, Elaine grogan Latrell, a few technical details are necessary. You've all come onto the line muted or in listen-only mode. This will just help us cut down on feedback. The more people on the line, the more chance of feedback we have. But you will be able to, throughout the presentation, um, there's a little button on your control panel. You can raise your hand or you can post questions. We'll talk about that in a second. So we'll have some interaction, I promise. There's one handout that Elaine has given us to load up into the system. You can find that under the Handouts tab in your control panel. If for some reason you can't see it or you can't get to it, I will make that available to you after the call. So don't worry, you'll get that. Um, we'll use the question box in your control panel for capturing your questions. So I'll monitor those and facilitate um, question and answers as we go where it makes sense. And at the end, definitely for sure. And Elaine, know that Elaine is open to all of your, your questions and things that are on your mind. We'll take three polls during the session. So this will be a chance for you to provide feedback in real time. And so when those pop up on the screen, I'll, you'll be able to click on your answer uh, from your computer if you're on your computer. The webinar is being recorded. And I'll, again, I'll make that link available to you as well as um, Elaine's slides and her handout via a Dropbox box link. Drop box link um, either later today or first thing tomorrow. And after today's webinar, I'll send you a, a link to a brief survey that we hope you'll just take five minutes to give us. It's just six questions. If you'll just give us a little feedback from today, it will help Elaine and help us know how to make these sessions better for all of you. So now I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar presenter, Elaine grogan Latrell, who's founder of Minerva Financial Arts. Elaine is a CPA, and her company is devoted to improving financial literacy among artists and arts organizations through education and coaching. In addition, she serves as the head, department head of business and entrepreneurship at the Columbus College of Art and Design, where she's also an assistant professor. Elaine previously served as the director of financial analysis for the Juilliard School and in the transaction advisory services practice of Ernst & Young in New York. Her work and presentations have been featured nationally by Devo's Institute of Arts Management, Americans for the Arts, Arts and Business Council of New York, the Foundation Center, and many others. Elaine is the author of a great book entitled Arts and Numbers, and she's a regular contributor to Professional Artist Magazine. She serves on the boards of the Center for Social Enterprise Development and the Short North Alliance. And some of you may have heard or met Elaine during the Ohio Arts Council's Arts Impact Ohio Conference in May. Her session was wildly popular, and we just thought it would be a great opportunity to bring her back to talk with us for an hour via webinar. So with that, I'm really pleased to present to you Ellen grogan Latrell. Thanks so much, Christy, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for organizing this. And huge thanks to the Ohio Arts Council for all they do to support learning opportunities like this one. Um, as Christy said, today we're talking about building a creative portfolio career. And this is one of my all-time favorite topics to talk about. Um, I find that the more we can kind of organize our thinking around diversifying our revenue streams and figuring out ways to prioritize the work we really want to do, uh, the more fulfilling and sustainable our creative careers can be. So that's the point of today's webinar and the content. Uh, the handout shows some shapes that'll help us kind of organize the conversation around portfolio careers. Um, so if you've got that, feel free to use it and take notes. Um, otherwise, you can certainly follow up later um, and use it to kind of gather some of your thoughts. Um, also, as Christy said, please ask questions. You can definitely feel free to interrupt us and sort of go through this. Um, we do have a lot of people on the line, but we want to make sure that you're getting the most information possible out of this particular webcast. So with that, let's dive on in. So 
So when we talk about being an entrepreneur or entrepreneurship, uh, this is a word that sometimes is kind of charged, particularly in creative industries. As Christy mentioned, I run the business and entrepreneurship department at the Columbus College of Art and Design. And some of our students and many of the professionals I've worked with throughout my career, sometimes they push back a little on this idea of being an entrepreneur. We know artists and other creative individuals have been entrepreneurial since the beginning of time, right? They embody a lot of the adjectives that entrepreneurs adopt. They persevere, they have grit, they hustle, they figure out how to make things work even when it doesn't seem like anything will be able to work. But some of them don't feel like they rise to the level of an entrepreneur, especially when we think about you know, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, right? a capital E entrepreneur who created this new thing. So where we wanted to start was by introducing some of these terms and then asking you for your feedback. So with that, we've got our first polling question. And the question is, do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? You should see it pop up on your screen there. And you can select one of the following answers, whichever one you think might be the best. And uh, we will watch and see those answers come in. All right, we'll give it one more second. Those of you who will, who want to weigh in. Great. All right, I'm going to close this poll, Elaine. That sounds good. So, so our results are 33% of you definitely consider yourself an entrepreneur. 58% say not really, but I'm entrepreneurial. And 8% of you said absolutely not. Well, thank you so much for submitting those results. Uh, that's pretty consistent with what we hear. Um, I love that some of you embrace the capital E entrepreneur label. Um, the majority of you are falling into that middle category where you say, not really, but you know, you are entrepreneurial. Um, and some of you do feel that resistance to the word entrepreneur, which is completely understandable. When I think about these terms, I think less about being an entrepreneur in the very literal sense of the word, which sometimes means new venture creation, um, angel investing, prototyping of a certain thing, scalability, and exit strategy, any of those other kind of entrepreneurial buzzwords that condone a very particular sort of industry. I think less about that and more about a subset of entrepreneurs um, that have what some people in entrepreneurship world call a lifestyle business. Now, a lifestyle business usually isn't scalable, meaning it can't grow to be a bagillion dollar business quickly, right? It's more just a sustainable way of diversifying your revenue and creating something that you enjoy doing. So a lifestyle business tends to be less about the number of zeros and less about creating returns for investors and more about building a career that you like. I think this also crosses over really nicely into this idea of being entrepreneurial, which is something you can do and be whether you are working for someone else or working for yourself or some combination of those two things. You'll see some numbers on the slide here. There are 2.1 million artists in the United States. Uh, depending on how you count the artists, this could be higher or lower, uh, depending on which data set you're looking at. Um, this one counts the number of people who spend the majority of their time doing art. So about 2.1 million people, it's about 0.7% of the population. It's a smidge higher than that as a percentage of the population in Ohio. It's closer to about 1%. And you'll see there that artists are three and a half times more likely to be self-employed than the U.S. workforce overall. And I don't think that's surprising at all. I think throughout time and since the beginning of time, artists have been entrepreneurial in that they have kind of pursued their own things and tried lots of different things that might be appealing at one particular time or another. So how can we take those natural tendencies and the idea of entrepreneurial skills that are very useful in a lot of ways, particularly in creative industries, and how can we put that into some sort of system that can help artists and creative individuals more broadly sort of organize their thinking and organize careers that would be both fulfilling and sustainable from a financial standpoint? 
the solution we came up with was this idea of a portfolio career. And lots of different people have talked about this idea. And the way I want to talk about it today is to break it down into three kind of main categories of work. Your main category is your starring role. You'll see that presented at the top. This is your thing. This is the thing that you would do if you had all the time in the world and money were no object. It's what you find the most fulfilling and it's how you identify yourself as a creative individual. You can define your starring role very, very broadly or very narrowly. It's entirely up to you. So for example, Christy mentioned that I am a CPA, a certified public accountant. That's what I would consider my starring role and that's a pretty broad descriptor. I have narrowed it throughout my career to be a more specific, narrow version of a CPA, one that works with artists and arts organizations. So depending on where you are and how you like to think of your work, you can think of it very broadly or very narrowly. Uh, writers in particular sometimes come up with very broad and then very specific definitions. Right? You can be a writer very broadly or you can be a very specific type of writer. Maybe you write children's literature or poetry or plays or something like that. And that's true across all sorts of creative disciplines. So defining your starring role is entirely up to you and you can define it in whatever way kind of feels right to you. We're going to come back to this idea a little bit later because part of how you define your starring role comes to how you articulate your competencies and the things that make you the most competent and special and unique and wonderful at what you do. And that's how we like to talk about the value of what we're delivering to whoever we're serving. So this idea of a portfolio career and how you talk about your different roles really does resonate in a lot of different areas across your career. The next category is this supporting cast role category. A supporting cast role is directly related to your starring role but it's not the starring role itself. So perhaps you are a visual artist and your thing is to do public art murals and that's your starring role and that's what you would do if you had all the time and all the money in the world. Maybe you also pursue related work that's not exactly your starting role, but it's close to it. Maybe you teach. Maybe you write about the importance of public art. Uh, maybe you work at an art supply store. Um, maybe you teach summer camps for children. Or maybe you volunteer or work for the parks department that has you know, a public art awareness type of program and you work in an administrative role with that. All of those things help support your starring role because there's some overlap, they're in the same industry, maybe you're working your skill set, maybe you're cultivating new audience members, right? There's some overlap and some connection between your supporting cast roles and your starring role, but it's not exactly the same thing. In my particular case, I mentioned that I'm a CPA, right? That's my starring role, and I work with artists and arts organizations, a very narrow definition of the starring role. And when I first started this business in 2009, I wanted to work with artists and arts organizations in a very specific way at a price point that was definitely attainable for them. Many other CPAs, particularly in New York, were charging $1,200, $1,500 for a tax return, and the groups I wanted to work with couldn't afford that. That was just way too much money for them on an annual basis. So I lowered my rates pretty substantially so that I could work with those I wanted to work with in the way I wanted to work with them. But in looking at the overall business plan, there were only so many hours I could spend completing tax returns and there weren't enough hours in the year for me to make enough money charging the rates I wanted to charge in order to support the business. So I developed these supporting cast roles so that I could diversify my revenue so that I could earn money from different things that were related to what I was doing with my clients. And by doing that, I took a lot of the financial pressure off of the direct client services. And for me, the supporting cast roles I loved the most were teaching and writing. It provided an opportunity to reach a larger audience, to share some technical information that was useful to a lot of different groups, and it also provided some revenue so that I could charge clients very, very discounted rates and everybody sort of won at the end. 
That's the purpose of these supporting cast roles. They are to take some pressure off of your starring role, particularly from a financial point of view, and help you develop technical skills or related skills or industry connections or anything else that can help complement your starring role overall. The third category we've got is called production assistance work. This is the work that we don't necessarily talk about all the time. Many people consider this like the day job kind of work, right? This is work that is temporary, it's repeatable, it's stable, you can go back to it if you find yourself in a situation where you need a little bit of extra money or maybe you need some more stability or you have other needs going on in your career, right? But you've got these opportunities to always go back to something that is temporary, stable, and repeatable that provides financial security or income to you. The difference here is that production assistance work doesn't have anything to do with your starring role, right? You're pretty much doing it just for the money or just for the scheduling benefits or just for whatever other intangibles you can pull out of it. It's important here to point out as well that production assistance work and supporting cast roles, these are kind of fuzzy distinctions and they may vary among different types of creative professionals. So a fashion designer, for example, might be, her starring role might be designing wedding dresses, right? Supporting cast role could be apprenticing for a different um, wedding designer or maybe she does alterations on the side or something like that, right? she may also consider working a retail job, a supporting cast role, because for her it's helping understand store layout and product placement and logistics and managing supply chains and markups and, and all sorts of other things like that that she might learn in a retail environment. Someone else, um, maybe a writer, maybe a sculptor, someone else might see working a retail job as a production assistance type of job. And that's perfectly fine, right? You can mix and match these categories and sort of organize your thinking in whatever way makes the most sense to you. If we were doing this live, this would be the part where I ask for some really good production assistance stories because that's where I think we get a lot of really great examples of those entrepreneurial skills that artists and other creative people sometimes put in place. Um, some of the best ones I've heard, we mentioned retail already, um, classic examples would be waiting tables or bartending. Um, babysitting tends to be a really good one, uh, depending on sort of what you prioritize and how you might want to earn money in a way that's not related to your starring role. Those are the sorts of things you should be looking at. Um, when we lived in New York, um, all of the babysitters for my daughter, um, when she was one and two years old, were artists working in different fields and then they were babysitting on the side. And it worked out great for them because there was some flexibility in the hours. They could trade shifts with each other if they had auditions or performances or something else to go to. And for them, it was a really nice way to give them some breathing room. Other production assistance work could be uh, working as a temp or in an administrative capacity. Um, before the Affordable Care Act, this was used a lot of times by people, particularly in law firms, when they needed health insurance for a period of time. Um, it's less of a need right now uh, because healthcare is more widely available, but that was a great flat option for, for many people. The other thing sometimes we talk about as we're going through these examples is the idea that as a creative person, whatever you do, is related to your creativity. So for example, maybe you're a bartender and that might count as production assistance work for many people, but maybe you use it as an opportunity to study people or understand characters more deeply. Um, maybe you adopt and embrace creativity in whatever you do. And in that regard, everything you do is connected to your starring role. And so that could be an interesting point of view as well if that's how you'd rather think about things. The point of these shapes in this conversation is simply to give you a framework and introduce some ideas about how you might categorize the different work that you do and be very clear and intentional about what you're getting out of it and how it relates to your starring role. 
I'll remind you here as well that you've got the question forum. Uh, so if you do have any questions, definitely feel free to type them in and we'll address them throughout this webinar. But these three shapes are the foundation for this idea of a portfolio career. Again, the starring role, your main thing, supporting cast roles, related activities that provide some um, additional streams of income and take some of the pressure off your starring role, and then production assistance work, work that is temporary, repeatable, and stable that you can go back to as your career ebbs and flows if you need to. Our next polling question asks you to think about your own creative career and think about how much of your income comes from what you would define as your starring role. So we've got a few options there. Is it more than 80%? Is it between about 50% and 80%? So just a little bit more than half. Is it between 20% and 50%? So a little bit less than half. Or is it less than 20%? Again, we're thinking about the amount of income that comes from what you define as your starring role. Yeah, so the votes are coming in. Take another couple seconds and then we'll close the poll. I'm going to close it on three. One, two, three. All right, Elaine. So the results are 22% um, for A, B, and C, and 33% on less than 20%. I think this is kind of amazing. Um, I think it's incredible how evenly split all of these answers are. Um, I would say kudos to those of you who earn more than 80% from your starring role. That's really absolutely fantastic. And those of you who are maybe earning less than 20% from your starring role, there could be plenty of reasons for that. And you know, in the follow-up, if you'd like to talk more about that, we can certainly do that. Um, you in the middle, depending on where you are in your career, there could be opportunities to increase the amount you're earning from your starring role, just given a bit more time and some organic development of relationships. Or we can look for some opportunities to expand your starry role, which is what we'll do in the next couple of slides. So thanks for answering that question. We appreciate it. A group called the Theater Development Fund out of New York um, did a similar study. And what they did is they surveyed playwrights. Uh, they were curious about how playwrights create a living in the theater field. And playwriting is a very specific aspect of American theater in particular. And the Theater uh, Development Fund produced this really wonderful read called Outrageous Fortune, The Life of the Times of the New American Play. And part of it that really resonated with me was the answer to the question, how do you playwrights earn your money? So you see a pie chart here presented with no labels, and that's intentional. Um, and each slice represents a different revenue stream. And this pie chart shows us overall, on average, how playwrights earn their money. And again, this is just one small sliver of the creative sector. But I think it's indicative of how we as creative individuals really are entrepreneurial in identifying opportunities to use our skills in ways that are related, closely related, and not at all related to our main creative pursuit or our starring role. Here are the labels that go with those slices. When we think about the starring role for a playwright, what we probably think of first is productions, right? Someone writes a play, it is produced, they receive residual income from the productions. That's that green slice at the top. And it's not a particularly large slice, right? So when we think about the amount of income playwrights earn from writing plays, it's a relatively small share of their overall income. Depending on how different playwrights draw the lines between their starring roles and their supporting cast roles, a playwright who defines 
his or her starring role very, very broadly, it might also include writing for film and television as part of the starring role as well. Someone who takes playwriting as a more literal interpretation of a starring role might consider those supporting cast role works. Again, there are no very clear-cut distinctions among these categories, and depending on how you define your own creativity, you can mix and match these in whatever way makes sense to you. Related writing, judging, and teaching round out the rest of the supporting cast role works, and then we see this huge swath of the pie as unrelated income. That's the production assistance work. And I found this to be just completely fascinating, particularly when we look at the types of people and the caliber of playwrights who were included in the survey. I think it was very eye-opening about how playwrights in particular, and perhaps artists more broadly, are really deriving income from a wide variety of sources. I want to switch gears slightly and ask the same question about um, how much is spent on your starring role, but I want to ask it in the context of time as opposed to in the context of money. So think about how you spend your time each week. Do you spend 80% or more of your time on your starring role? Or at the opposite end of the schedule, do you spend less than 20% of your time on your starring role? Or do you fall somewhere in the middle? I'll be curious to see if these results shake out as evenly as the, res as the uh, income results did. <laughs> yeah, you're going to draw some, some correlations there, right, Elaine, when you see these results with those results? Let's hope so. Let's do another, <clears throat> another second. I'm going to do my countdown. Closing in one, two, three. All right. So the results, Elaine, are 80%, I'm sorry, 8% spend more than 80%. 50% are between 50 and 80. 17% are between 20 and 50. And 25% are less than 20%. This to me is fascinating, um, particularly because it doesn't line up perfectly with the results we saw earlier about how people earn their income. So for example, 22% of people had 80% or more of their income coming from their starring roles, and yet only 8% of people spend more than 80% of their time on their starring roles. Um, I would love to talk about or talk with these people later because you're finding a way to really maximize the income from your starring role without maximizing the time you spend on your starring role. And there are a lot of ways we could do this. It could be something like uh, royalties or, or other types of work. It could have to do with how we're defining starring role and supporting cast role work. Um, but what I really find interesting as well is this middle section, right, where if we add up um, the middle two responses from the last one, right? We had about 44% of people who were in those middle two categories. And then if we look at how you spend your time, we're at almost 70% of people who spend their time in these middle categories. I'd say those of you who spend between 20 and 50% of your time on your starring role, um, you earn maybe about the same amount in terms of percentage of your overall income. But I find it really interesting how there's so much fungibility between how we spend our time and how we spend our income. I think it's a curious and interesting exercise to think about that and think about how you are approaching your week and approaching your income measures in a very deliberate way to prioritize how you're going to spend your time and see how much that does or doesn't correlate to how you spend your income. And if it correlates, that's fantastic. If not, let's understand why not, because there are plenty of reasons why it might not line up perfectly, and the interesting part of the analysis is in those reasons. Hey, Elaine, would this be a good time for a question? This would be a great time for a question. <laughs> All right, we have one. So this is from Abe. Thank you, Abe, for being our brave early adopter and submitting the first question. Um, he says, I have a well-documented starring role track that has been interrupted by a career shift interval of nearly 20 years 
where I've become recognized and successful, but not as an artist. My question then would be about folks like me, people who consider themselves artists, who have also had some sort of hiatus in their art track. Can you speak to some success examples or stories of individuals who have faced such challenges and successfully managed to reemerge as artists? I love this question, Abe. Thank you so much for sharing it. I think it's indicative of how life unfolds in very unexpected and unpredictable ways oftentimes. Um, you mentioned you attained some fame and notoriety, some success in non-art related fields, and what's really interesting about that is the story you tell about it in the context of your creativity and in the context of your art. It's entirely possible that you might identify on this time spectrum that we have in front of us more along the left side, right, where the majority of your work experience has been in production assistance work, something not related to your art. But then you have some of your time devoted to your art and your creativity, and that's where you really thrive. The beauty of these portfolio careers are that you can mix and match these things depending on the opportunities that have presented themselves and also depending on where you are within your career. Um, sometimes um, mid-career artists, or I would say those who have emerged but have maybe not attained the full pinnacle of their creativity, sometimes at that point, depending on what other familial and life commitments might be underway, the opportunity to prioritize roles that come with more predictability, more security, more financial stability, those opportunities can be very, very appealing. And then as you refocus or reprioritize your art at different points in your career, you can take that security that you've built and really use it to enable you to pursue the starring role in the way you want to pursue it. I think we could probably continue this conversation offline if you'd like, and, and I would welcome that opportunity to learn more about your specific situation and how, how that might continue to evolve and the types of um, stories we can create around the success that you've had and how it relates back to your starring role. The far left, again, as part of this graphic, does show someone who might spend a majority of time doing something not related to the starring role. And then at the opposite end, on the far right, we have someone who spends almost all of their time on their starring role. Um, we might call uh, the, this person Yo-Yo Ma or someone like that, right? LeBron James, where you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can do your starring role all of the time, and maybe you'll do something else like judge a contest here and there, right? But mostly what you can do is whatever you want with respect to your starring role all of the time. It's these middle two categories that are interesting. The one on sort of on the left part of the middle with about half of the time devoted to production assistance work might be representative of someone, again, who wants some measure of stability or someone who is relatively early in his or her creative career. At this point, having some production assistance work really does give you the flexibility to let your relationships evolve more organically because it takes a while to develop relationships with galleries or with arts councils or with others in the field or with customers or clients or however your creativity sort of comes to play in whatever terms make sense within the context of your own individual creativity, developing those relationships takes time. And of course, our starring role and supporting cast role work sometimes hinges on those relationships. So the idea that those take time to evolve and your production assistance work can give you some room to breathe so you can let those evolve organically is an empowering one. And then as you continue throughout your career and those relationships have evolved and your business plan has come together in a pretty coherent way, then the production assistance work can be minimized as your starring role and supporting cast role work take over. Now, I've had this conversation with a number of different creative individuals from 
all parts of the creative sector. And I was working with a writer once who took a look at this and just hated it. He had a really, really negative reaction to it. And then we talked about why, because the why is always the interesting part. And for him, his preference was to live sort of on the left side of this chart, where he was preserving his starring role in exactly the way he wanted to do it. And I mentioned he was a writer. He's a playwright who writes very, very challenging works, who struggle sometimes to find larger audiences. But he wanted to write what he wanted to write in the way he wanted to write it. And he shared with me that any time he was engaging what he called the creative part of his brain in anything that wasn't his starring role, he found himself so drained he wasn't able to put any energy toward his starring role. So for him, the most ideal way to exist was with production assistance work that was temporary, repeatable, stable, low stress, provided some structure to his day, but also didn't take up such an incredible amount of time so that he couldn't then also pursue his starring role. So for him, the ideal portfolio career was a lot of production assistance work and then a starring role in exactly the way he wanted to do it. Others think of this very, very differently and find a really nice balance between supporting cast role work and starring role work, and that's perfectly fine. During this same workshop where this writer found this graphic to be very challenging, one of his colleagues was sharing how important she felt teaching was to the field of playwriting. And for her, she defined it as new audience development. And for her, it was a crucial part of supporting her starring role. Her theory was if we don't teach people how to really appreciate the written and spoken word in a live theatrical setting, then there's no future for her particular starring role at all. So depending on your own personal strengths and weaknesses and how you like to spend your time and what you find fulfilling and energizing versus what you find draining, there are a lot of different options here, again, for you to mix and match these different categories in the way that makes the most sense for you. The handout you have is this portfolio career map that reproduces these shapes, and I would encourage you to spend some time reflecting on the different types of roles you have and how they fit into these different categories. We're not going to take time to do that as part of this webinar because it's only an hour, but you've got the handout there to reflect upon later, to think through it later, and to kind of mix and match to see what things might work for you. The next step in this analysis is to do some more personal reflection on your own strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. In a business or entrepreneurial context, we would call this a SWOT analysis, a very typical standard business-like approach where we look both internally at ourselves, at our own strengths and our own weaknesses, and also externally at opportunities that might exist in the world and also threats that might exist to our industry or to our life livelihood in the world. That's sort of a dramatic term for it, but you know, something like um, curtailed funding for the arts, if our work is heavily reliant on public funding, would be an example of an external threat here. So let's start with strengths. As you're reflecting on your own personal strengths, and we can call them competencies or part of what makes you uniquely you or something like that, right? We can dive in and talk about your own individual strengths. And in a perfect world, your individual strengths line up beautifully with your starring role, right? So when you're using your strengths in the context you want to use them, that's living the creative dream, right? And what we want to do is maximize those opportunities as much as possible, right? So as you're thinking about the starring role work you do, whether it's broadly defined or narrowly defined, think about the strengths you have that make you particularly good at those types of works. At the same time, let's think about our own personal weaknesses as well. We don't want to dwell on them, but it is important to understand what your weaknesses are so that you know what opportunities to ignore. 
Earlier we mentioned uh, teaching as a potential supporting cast role. For many people, that provides stability and fulfillment, and as our playwright friend put it, new audience development, which many people love. But for others, that is not a fulfilling opportunity, and that's not an enjoyable use of time. So if you're the sort of person that doesn't enjoy teaching, it doesn't matter how many opportunities there might be for that. If that doesn't fulfill you and doesn't provide the intangible benefits that you need to be able to justify it, it's not worth it. So knowing your own weaknesses and what you prefer to do and prefer not to do, in addition to knowing your strengths, is so important in identifying the opportunities to pursue and in identifying the opportunities not to pursue. I mentioned earlier that the production assistance work um, that we encountered most often when living in New York was among our babysitters. There was a dancer and an opera singer and a pastry chef and um, a graphic designer, a whole host of very creative individuals who were using babysitting as production assistance work. And again, it was temporary, repeatable, stable. They could add hours or work fewer hours depending on what other opportunities presented themselves. And for them, that was wonderful. But if you're not the sort of person that enjoys children or enjoys babysitting, that's a terrible choice for your production assistance work. There are plenty of other things you could do that is temporary, repeatable, and stable and will get you out of a financial bind. There's no need to pursue something that will make you miserable simply for financial stabi stability. The object of this is to provide some overall context and stability so that you can take the pressure off of your starring role so that you never have to say yes to something you would rather say no to just for the money. And if the work you're doing is so draining that you're not able to enjoy your starring role when you do have a moment for it, then it's time to reassess your categories. So don't dwell on your weaknesses, but do know that understanding your strengths and your weaknesses or your preferences or lack of preferences is just as important as understanding what else is going on in the world around you. Threats to your business um, are external things that affect what it is that you're doing. We mentioned um, curtailed funding if your work relies on public funding for the arts as a potential threat. Um, depending on the type of creativity, there could be other threats as well. Um, if you are a writer, uh, the advent of blogs could have been a huge threat to your creativity because all of a sudden anyone in the world could become a writer without pursuing the professional level of writing that you might be accustomed to. Many of our photographer friends saw this come about um, with disposable cameras and now with phones that have phenomenal built-in cameras, all of a sudden everyone is a photographer. So that um, leveling of the playing field kind of is a threat to photography because our professional photographer friends need to spend more time explaining and differentiating themselves and their skills from anyone with a phone. And anytime they're spending more time doing that, they're not spending nearly as much time doing what they want to be doing. So those are some examples of threats. External occurrences that are completely out of your control that you might have to address within the context of your creative career. I'd like to end this SWOT analysis by talking about opportunities. This to me is the most interesting part. Just as using your strengths for exactly what you want to be doing is a manifestation of your starring role, using your strengths and finding opportunities to use those strengths is a manifestation of the supporting cast roles. So perhaps you have incredible visual art skills, right? Or maybe you are a phenomenal editor. As you have these skills, right, you can look for opportunities to put those skills to use by cultivating supporting cast role work, which is a really interesting way to take some pressure off of your starring role so that you can 
develop some financial stability and security so that you never have to say yes to something you'd rather say no to. In entrepreneurship world, sometimes we define opportunity as a solution to a problem. And I think that's an interesting way to define opportunity. And more importantly, I wanted to bring this back to this entrepreneurial spirit that artists often adopt and that the majority of you on this call said you adopted, that you are entrepreneurial. And if we wanted to put this definition of opportunity into action, we would say, I can be the solution to your problem. So the idea of really understanding your strengths, really understanding what makes you the most talented creative person in your field, what makes you unique, what makes you special as a creative individual, and looking for ways to apply those and communicate that value to different potential groups of people you might serve is a really interesting way to grow your supporting cast role opportunities. And there are plenty of ways of doing that, some more specific than others. Um, to the extent that being a teaching artist is part of what you do, there are lots of opportunities through the Ohio Arts Council and through others to identify outlets for your skills in ways that might not necessarily be obvious right on the surface. Those of you who attended the Arts Impact Day earlier this summer heard Patty Mitchell speak about using her work as a teaching artist and partnering with groups of people with perceived disabilities in a medicinal-like context for art exploration. It's not a traditional path for a teaching artist, and yet it's a great way to make use of your unique strengths in a way that identifies some opportunities and for the right person, find some fulfillment out of those types of roles. So that's what we're doing here. We're looking for some framework for organizing our creative careers around starring roles, supporting roles, and then also production assistance work. And we're personally reflecting our own strengths and weaknesses so that we can identify opportunities to use our strengths and build out our repertoire of starring roles and supporting cast roles so that we never have to say yes to something we'd rather say no to just for the money. As you continue reflecting upon this, there's some room on the handout on your portfolio career map to start listing some of your strengths that might be associated with any of the roles you put in those different shapes. And again, as you're summarizing these words and articulating your strengths, those are the words you should be coming back to as you describe the value you're producing for others, whether you are pitching opportunities or negotiating a fee. Anytime you can come back to words that describe your strengths and your competencies, that's the best way to communicate your value. So now what? The goal after reviewing this, and we've spent about 50 minutes now summarizing this, the goal is to recap starring roles, supporting cast roles, and production assistance work, and then maximize your strengths in these different categories and really understand what you like to do, what you enjoy doing, what you find fulfilling, and how you can mix and match these categories of work to build your own creative career that is sustainable and, more importantly, creatively fulfilling. We want to also spot opportunities to use our strengths in interesting ways that may not be obvious on the surface. This is where that entrepreneurial creativity really becomes important because you've got this inherent creativity and this inherent entrepreneurial spirit that can help you identify opportunities that others might not necessarily be able to see. And when you can identify those, you can identify more outlets for your strengths and then more paths to sustainable financial fulfillment. Last but not least, we want to make sure to the extent possible, we are aligning how we spend our time and how we spend and earn our income with our priorities, both as creative individuals and as humans, because the more in line and in sync those things can be, the better we'll be and the more creatively fulfilled we will be. 
I will leave this with you, and I suspect we have had a few more questions come in. Christy, do we have any more to answer? We do have another question, uh, Elaine. And this comes from Eric. He says, I live in an area where there aren't many supporting roles. They're selectively given out and reserved for, uh, I didn't quite finish that sentence, but maybe particular people. So what's a good way to get around these types of situations? That's a great question. Um, Eric, I, I completely feel your pain. I understand that it can be really challenging. Um, the leveling of the playing field in terms of the internet can be really helpful here. So even if um, a supporting cast role work might be you know, teaching or it might be working in an art supply store or maybe working in a gallery or something like that, something related to your creativity. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming you're a visual artist, Eric, but I actually have no idea. So maybe it's working in a bookshop or, or something else. Um, but depending on what types of roles you find fulfilling, there are opportunities to explore supporting roles online that make use of those skills without being limited by geography and relationships and opportunities that maybe exist for others, but not necessarily in a very open way. So without knowing more specifics about your creativity, Eric, I'd suggest maximizing online opportunities to the extent possible, and also broadening the geography just a smidge. Sometimes, and this might not be possible, not all of my ideas are good ones, but sometimes if we can widen our radius just a little bit, all of a sudden we'll find additional opportunities that maybe don't require as much travel as you know, different opportunities that might be further away might, or you know, we can just widen the lens just a smidge and identify some more opportunities. But Eric, I'll be happy to catch up with you <clears throat> offline if you want to continue this conversation, and maybe we can brainstorm some more ideas together. Yeah, great. You guessed right, uh, Elaine. He is a visual artist, so good guess. <laughs> <laughs> Any additional questions? So you're the second person, Elaine, that I've heard this week. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sometimes you don't, talk, you don't talk for a while. Um, second person I've heard you say in a week about individuals thinking about their competencies. And I think that's a really interesting word. Um, I spent a little time in a public school district, and we hear that word a lot around with students and learning. What's their, what are their competencies? So to think about how we really define that in our adult life, wherever we find ourselves, I think is it's just interesting to me that I've heard that twice in one week from two um, really smart women I respect. <laughs> so thank you for that. Absolutely. That's, that's one of my favorite words. And it, in my work, it tends to come up not only in an educational setting, but also when we're talking about pricing. Um, and in the context of developing prices for your work, this is completely off the script, but I don't mind dabbling in it just a moment since we have a couple minutes. Um, in the context of pricing, you think about your costs, your direct and indirect costs, what your customers are doing, what your competition is doing. Those are the first three C's. And then the fourth C that affects your price is this word that starts with C, your competencies. And for me, that's the most magical part of pricing because it really is unique to each individual person, and it really does capture the spirit of the value that you deliver, no matter what your creative output is. And that, to me, is so much more powerful than just looking at costs or dollars or input items or markups. That really captures the spirit of the value we do. And if we can apply that to identifying opportunities as well, that, to me, is a really exciting way to empower artists across the creative spectrum to really take charge of building creative, fulfilling, and sustainable careers. Yeah, that's great. It makes me think about, you know, that pricing is also a really popular topic um, for artists and, and organizations. So maybe we'll think about a future session on pricing. Yeah, I suspect that would probably be interesting, and I suspect plenty of people can weigh in in the follow-up survey if that's something that would appeal to them. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, again, feel free to jump in there if you have one. If not, we'll begin to wrap up today's webinar.
really want to thank Elaine. Thank you so much, Elaine, for this presentation. It was really great. I've heard you do this a couple of times, and I always learn something uh, new. So thank you for that very much. Um, if you want to reach Elaine, her information is at the bottom of the PowerPoint slides, but info at minervafinancialarts.com. And you're open to that, right, Elaine? Follow-up questions, emails? Absolutely. Follow-up questions, emails. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. We have some online learning resources. If you want to go deeper on any of these things, I would be happy to make myself available for some follow-ups to participants of this call. Great. All right. So with that, we'll let you go on and enjoy your day. Thank you, everybody, for logging in today. We hope you found this call, this um, webinar valuable. I'll send you the resources um, very shortly. As soon as the recording is done, I'll get that out to you. And we just hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.